Thank you, colleagues. I'm pleased to be invited here by the organizers, and um, I'm great, grateful for the uh, um, for the moderators uh, to give this nice introduction. I'm going to give a presentation from the patient perspective, and uh, the points that I'll cover in my talk are the issues for the newly diagnosed, um, understanding the changing treatment algorithm around PRRT, and how patients choose a PRRT therapy center. So the role of the group leader is to counsel patients. And so I'm a group leader for a support group in Singapore known as Carcinoid Neuroendocrine Tumor Society. And what we do is we offer seminars and we provide resources online for patients who are newly diagnosed and also patients who have had their disease for a while. Um, we make it easier for um, specialist physicians and pharmaceutical companies to engage with the patient community. And to some extent, we try to articulate of the patients and speak with a collective voice, for example, on issues of uh, orphan drugs. Okay, so let me just begin by telling you a bit about my journey as a patient. So um, I had a primary about the same time as Steve Jobs, founder of Apple. Um, mine was removed in 2004, uh, and actually I was diagnosed uh, during the surgery. And for about three years, I was looking around for PRT, and I, I tried in Fremantle and eventually um, went to Erasmus and had four cycles of PRT at Erasmus. And I got good result from that, but after some time, symptoms came back. And this is because of the three-year lapse the time the primary was removed. So some of the metastases had an opportunity to grow to maybe two or three cm. So the PRT didn't really properly address those. But um, when the symptoms came back, I had debulking surgery in 2010. And um, at that time, uh, and since then, I've been more or less clear on scans, and all my markers are normal. So the combination of these two therapies has been a good solution for me. And I'm more or less in complete remission at this time. Um, so that's the clinical side of my journey, and the psych um, aspect is typical of a lot of um, patients and patient group leaders in particular, which is that it starts out with kind of a confusion, and then you spend a lot of time on the Internet looking for solutions and figuring out that, okay, hormone therapy means octreotide, and octreotide has octreoscan potential for diagnostic imaging, and then you learn about PRT. And then from there, you go deeper and start sharing with others who are going through the same journey. And eventually, you become a kind of semi-pro. And I think that's where I like to position myself now is a lot of people say, oh, you know as much as a doctor. That's definitely not true. But I kind of classify myself as a semi-pro. Now, the reason this uh, zebra is a common uh, um, sort of uh, mascot for carcinoid neuroendocrine tumor groups is that it represents the, there seems to be a feedback, okay. Uh, it represents the misdiagnosis of the patients. So what um, physicians learn in medical school is that, you know, if they hear hoofbeats, they're supposed to think horses and not think zebras, the rare case. They, they should look first for the more common cause. Um, about 20% of the general population has symptoms that might be suspect for carcinoid, which are IBS-like symptoms. So to find these uh, true neuroendocrine tumor cases is like a needle in a haystack. The gastroenterologists are more or less the first line, and they discover these cases. And then surgeons sort of take over, and surgery is, of course, the only curative option. Um, and the oncologists really come in a little later. And the oncologists kind of take the perspective of wait and see, which is not really good for the patient, and that's why the zebra is looking a little depressed. Um, the diagram that you see is from Shell Oberg, um, and it shows the patient at the center of this uh, multidisciplinary team. But this diagram is misleading because it assumes that the team exists there somewhere, and that's not really the case. The tumor boards exist, uh, but the, this 
multidisciplinary team has to be assembled. So who does this job? Um, what I tell the patients is to let their medical oncologist do it. So the medical oncologist plays this role as kind of a team lead to assemble the rest of the team. And then there's the role of the caregiver, which whenever I meet a patient, you know, everybody sort of pays so much attention to the patient, how are you doing? But I spend a lot of time giving attention to the caregiver because they're the ones actually undergoing a lot of stress and doing all the research and so on without pay and benefits, of course. So I've begun to paint a picture of the patient who's very uncertain about their disease and they don't know who to trust and they've got to go and find these specialist physicians to help them out. Every patient who's a, got a rare cancer is essentially going through a clinical trial with a cohort of one which is the title of my talk. Um, and they end up getting their best uh, advice from support groups and from online forums. And this is quite widely um, known in the patient community, is they really trust their peers. So as they start down this journey, the clinical journey, they have to decide on the best treatment algorithm. And they have to find a center of excellence which has a multidisciplinary team, which follows consensus guidelines, and they have to plan for contingencies in case, for example, there's not, not very good dosimetry and they might end up with symptoms that look more like a leukemia case, you know, where their hemoglobin and blood platelets just go down and never come back up again. But the good news is that these patients, for the most part, have time to plan their treatment. They're not like carcinoma patients. Now, you're all probably familiar with Chekhov plays. Um, in a Chekhov play, um, if a gun is put on the table in the first act, it's usually going to be fired by the third act. And you are all carrying metal, and, and you're all uh, ready to shoot with PRT. But the question is, when is the appropriate time to shoot? And in this diagram, I'm showing the three, um, what we call the, um, how to say, um, um, first line, second line, and third line treatments. According to the classical model uh, in this diagram by Shell Oberg, uh, surgery is the first line, and then we go to second line, and PRT is really only in the third line. And what I'm going to propose is that uh, PRT should be the second line treatment. Well, at least for the uh, low proliferation cases. So most of these patients come with metastatic disease, and they typically say their first thing is, oh, it must be bad because I've been told that I have stage 4, which really doesn't mean anything when you have a low proliferation index. Um, the surgeons who are looking at a case, an oncological uh, surgeon doesn't like to operate on stage four because they can't do a zero resection, you know, zero. They need margins, they want to get everything out or at least 80% of it. So mostly these uh, stage four cases go into uh, octreotide therapy with wait and see. And only on progression will they get the targeted radiotherapy. But if you read the papers, they say that the best result for PRT is early intervention when there's small distant metastases, not big metastases. And furthermore, when the patient has still got good receptors, and it's a known phenomenon that the um, receptors tend to diminish their capacity over time. So patients who have been on octreotide for five or 10 years have dose escalation issues. This is a well-known phenomenon, and it certainly affects the benefits of PRT. So um, the change in the uh, aging protocol would be to move PRT as a second-line therapy and use octreotide as an anti-proliferation treatment. And there's potentially other anti-proliferative treatments uh, in the medical pipeline. So move the checkoff uh, story, move the gun into the second act is what I'm saying. Now, the patient has to find a center of excellence to get this multidisciplinary care. So I would guide the patient to compile all their records into some kind of disk media. It means 
take scanned copies or PDFs of their written reports uh, and include the DICOM images from their uh, imaging scans with an open source DICOM reader. And then they have that and they can send it off to Europe or wherever they intend to get treatment for the evaluation by the physicians there. Now, Europe is currently providing the best treatment options. Um, I've listed in alphabetical order some of the centers of excellence. The diagram on the right um, exemplifies why the treatment is better in Europe than the US, and it's because they spend so much more on medical research than the Americans do. I'm American, um, but it's really, I live in Singapore. Um, it's sad, the kind of state of care in the US, really, uh, there, there needs to be a lot more done for the patients. The ENETS consensus guidelines are basically the world standard, and they're widely adopted by others who are developing standards. And the focus on personalized therapy is coming from Europe and not from the United States. So now the patient wants to go and find their PRT center, many to choose from. So uh, again, in alphabetical order, how do they choose? So um, I've been doing some thinking about this and discussing with other patient group leaders. And my feeling is that there's just half a dozen criteria and cost is not the most important of these. So in a kind of a prior prioritized ranking, um, I'll just step through them quickly and share my thoughts on these with you. So the centers themselves have to have basic information in English about the PRT therapy. So of course they will have a website for their hospital or university hospital, but they need to have a little bit of basic information about the availability of PRT in the nuclear medicine center. And other sites need to link back to the center's website and provide descriptions of patient experiences. All of you who are traveling regularly for conferences like this, you must have used things like TripAdvisor to select your hotel. So think of that. You don't just go to the hotel's website to decide whether they have nice rooms. You go to TripAdvisor and you see what people are saying about the rooms. That's the way the patients need to understand what's going on in your centers. And then, of course, it's nice if there are white papers and things like that that they can read. Reputation is important from two aspects. Um, not only must the patients feel that the center is credible, but their referring physician needs to know that the center is credible. So the referring physician might want to call somebody up and say, you know, how many patients have you treated there and, and kind of get a good touchy-feely about the center. So that's important. And then, of course, the peers um, have to have a regard, and that's basically represented by the seal of excellence called the Center of Excellence stamp or whatever they, they're using for the name of that. So I visited now about six of these nuclear medicine PRT and they ask me, is this center of excellence thing important? And, and actually, it is pretty important. But the most important thing from the patient's perspective is when they send an email to somebody at one of these centers, they want a reply. They want a yes, a no, or a maybe. They need to know what additional information they need to compile in order to provide the information that the center can make a decision. It's not enough to just say they have uptake on a gallium scan. Um, many of the patients approach these centers without any idea what a KI-67 is or a CGA test result is, and they need a little bit of help. A little checklist has to be there for them to say, okay, you assemble these things, and then we can eval evaluate, and it will you know, give us 14 days to decide, and then we'll get back to you. And you'd be surprised how many really great centers um, that have this seal of center of excellence do rather poor case management. Patients drop through the cracks. Um, obviously, there also has to be a post-therapy tracking. Um, the centers which offer personalized care would be the ones that at least I would recommend. So what do we mean when we say personalized care? So dosimetry has to be there. And support with gallium imaging is a very important part of the dosimetry. And there are centers, I won't name them, but they're offering PRT, but they're not really doing dosimetry. Well, for that perspective, I mean, from that perspective, Erasmus could be uh, considered that, right? Because when I was there, I got half a curie four times 
to Curie's total dosage over four s sessions. And everybody gets that, whether it's a big guy like me or a petite lady. So they're not really doing dosimetry. They're doing planar imaging. Maybe that's changing at Erasmus. Um, but it needs to change in all the centers. And then now there's more and more comparison of FTG PET to see if some of the tumors are um, poorly differentiated and whether those poorly differentiated tumors overlap with the well-differentiated ones that show up on the gallium scan. And whether they have lutetium, I mean, most all of the centers have lutetium, but whether they also have yttrium is important for patients who have heavy tumor burden. And then many of the centers are starting to practice a combination therapy with chemo agents. So this is very personalized care, right? All of these things are done with the idea of giving the right dose at the right time to the individual patient. Cost is not really much of an issue, but um, so far as I understand, the average cost for initial setup is about 10K. And then for the second, third, and fourth phase, it will be something like $8,000. But there are places like uh, here in India where the cost is much less. So the patient will look at all of the factors, not only the cost. Accessibility is important. Um, the centers, uh, like let's say Chandigarh, you, you would say that it's a short drive to PGI from the airport in Chandigarh. And it's maybe a short flight from Delhi. So I think that's the way we can kind of standardize this measurement is how far you are from the hub airport in the region and then how far you are from the airport when you get to the town. Um, and many of the centers kind of promote the fact that they have holistic care. Bad Burka says that there are spas. Um, Innsbruck says that they have a beautiful color scheme and nice music and crystals and things like that to, you know, give comfort to the patient as they're going through this process which can be a little bit startling. So it's more than just quality of life surveys. I took note that you're interested in quality of life survey. Um, the patients think that quality of life surveys are important as well, but it's more than that. So those are the criteria. And when I talk to patients about how they're going to succeed and get through this, I, I use two things that I repeat to them right at the beginning. And one is they have to use their engineering mind and not worry. So that's really key. Some of them are very stressed with the initial diagnosis, so they have to think about how they're going to get through this. And the second thing is they have to take ownership for their disease. Steve Jobs, unfortunately, really didn't take ownership for his disease. And I think that is one of the key um, lessons about what went wrong in that case. So in summary, the patients are somewhat distrustful of physicians because of this experience of delayed diagnosis, which is so common. And the patients are unwilling to take a wait and see approach. They want something more proactive. And medical tourism is really the result of the need for um, multidisciplinary care. And the fact that these multidisciplinary tend to be in the centers of excellence. Patients have to decide on the PRT therapy based on several factors, and I've highlighted reputation, case management, and personalized care as probably the most important. And participatory medicine, I think, delivers the best results. So the current treatment algorithm really has to be reviewed. And so as somebody who you know, is involved in um, the participatory medicine aspect, engaging with the physicians who are helping the patients um, I would always advocate that PRT needs to be a second line and not a third line treatment. Well, um, I'm going to start this little clip, but I'd like you to read Ellie Weissel quote while you um, listen to this one of our um, patients. Let's see here how to get this going. There we go. Audio up, please. Before I came to Singapore, I have a chemos eight times in Singapore, nine times in Siloam, Jakarta. And it hasn't worked anything. I, uh, I come to Singapore to try PRRT treatment because I heard this treatment from my doctor uh, in Siloam. 
this treatment is can cure neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, before they agree to recommend me to do the PRRT, I must do through many many tests. For instance, a selenium beta test scan. It is a scan that uh, can determine if I am eligible or not to have an PRRT treatment. When I I go through this. Uh, uh, test galenium dota test scan. The result is uh, I'm eligible to uh, I'm I'm eligible, so I'm a candidate for PRRT treatment. Yeah, before uh, I begin my PRRT, I had a complication that is uh, my left kidney. I had hydronephrosis. Uh, that is. Uh, The function of the the function of the uretra is not well, so it, it cannot clear clear uh, clear clear the clear the fluid. So uh, I must um, been operated to put a stem in my uretra because uh, for PRRT treatment. Uh, we must have a good kidney because uh, PRRT drug is a nephrotoxic. So uh, our kidney must be okay first before we can do the PRRT treatment. PRRT treatment itself is uh, very nice, I think. Uh, it is a kind of like chemo, but we with less side effect. Uh, which is nausea, vomiting, boldness, hair fall, like that. Uh, but we must go through many, many scans. And the monitoring of it after the PRR3 itself is, uh, is very strict. I find the care in Singapore is very good. The doctor is professional. The nurses also very professional, and uh, they are very, um, they are very precise. They are very precise, and they monitoring all. And I'm, uh, I feel I'm very secure here uh, with uh, with uh, the kind of uh, treatment, cure, and doctors in Singapore. So that's um, the voice of the patient. I, I end on that note, and uh, this is the cohort of uh, our uh, treatment at Erasmus in 2007. And as you can see, we all are very excited about being able to take advantage of this fantastic therapy. Uh, it, it's a kind of statistical note that I think we were amongst the first three or four hundred that were treated at Erasmus back in that period of time, 2007. Um, most of these patients are alive. Uh, the one young lady who's holding the balloon uh, sadly passed away late last year. That's the end of my presentation. Thanks a lot, Bill. Uh, this was uh, the patient point of view and describing us what the patient need for us, what kind of the information.